This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. My future, well, I'm 72 years old, so I don't know what kind of future I will have, but I will worry about my grandchildren, their future. I have hope of going places, of going different places, of helping people, things, and, of getting, and getting a good job to support family and make my family proud. The world is beautiful, like this sculpture, and it's, you know, Let's clean up this hot mess so that we don't have to deal with what we see here going on, with it melting and disappearing before our own eyes. When the art is actually beautiful and um, we're just such visual people, so why not have the message be that um, direct? It's right here, this, this confluence of streets at Madison Square Park and Flatiron District, and it's this melting words. It's very incredibly languid and poignant the future as it drips and melts for us. This depicts in a, in a very conceptually valid way what it's about and 
the future, which is our world, is slowly disappearing. It's really nice for this to be happening in conjunction with the marsh. You have a lot of people like ourselves who have now dispersed, and for there to be another echo of, yeah, people are talking about this, caring about this, so it's important for it to exist here in the streets, and it doesn't always speak to everyone in a gallery or museum context. You want to, to engage, you want to stop and think about it, you want to share. This is um, the kind of art that I hope can, I mean, you, this one isn't going to be here tomorrow, and we know that. A lot of people are, are you know, coming and taking pictures, and they want to take you know, like a memory with them, you know, because they know that it's melting away the art, so tomorrow it will not be here. They like to touch, you know, the ice. So, you know, like somehow they, they like to interact with the art because it's, you know, like has a time frame. This way to put it in the middle of the square by everybody it means people, they are going to see it and they are going to remember it. In the city, you're, you're surrounded by language, you're surrounded by signs, you're surrounded by advertising. So it's nice to see a sort of a pertinent kind of text, like the future melting. It's kind of got a lot of connotations from a semiotic level. I think this is a, a really important for public art because it actually brings people who are not in the march and not connected to the march directly in contact with the issues. And also the pace such a slow pace the way it melts, so I, I like that too in a, in a hectic city, especially on this corner, I think it's really effective. When do they expect that it will fall down? Do they have a prediction? Maybe 8, 9 o'clock at night. And see which letter will go first. <laughs> My hope is that people really get touched and get into action. Definitely something is going on that is not right. So I think we're stuck on making everyone realize that there's a problem because some people still don't believe there's a problem. People have made more impact on our environment than the environment itself. We have caused much of this change that is occurring. So it's Anthropocene is a very good term for it, I think, because it's, it's addressing that this is caused by us. We've got to get the big guys. And you have to do the big, you have to be big, you have to, in your face, this is big, in your face, this is what's going to happen in the future. And, and it's our future dripping away, melting away, okay? And we could do something about it. The planet is suffering. We are going through this, this uh, mess of, uh, you know, changes in the climate that we could handle, we could do something about. And I think that's what we need to have come out of this. If we define it, define what we have to do, address the political will, and try to do something. I don't know what the future will look like, but I, I know that there will be one, and I'm committed to working for it. Through things like this, where it's very clear that people come together and they understand what it is about, that we can, we can have conversations about what our future will look like. And it's just about like really putting people together, you know, because if like there's you, there's me, there's him, we're already three, right? So it can get more people and just get more motivated and then things can change. And I do believe on that. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course Big History, and today we're going to talk about the Anthropocene. Mr. Green, Mr. Green! Anthropocene? What does that even mean? That sounds like gibberish. No, me from the past. Your 10th grade essays were gibberish. The Anthropocene is a word derived from the Greek word for human. Like, you know how anthropologists study humans? Well, the Anthropocene is an unofficial geologic era where humans have an immense influence over the biosphere. But I want to emphasize that it is unofficial because geologists are a vicious and terrifying bunch and the word is not official until they say it's official. But even if it's not yet a word, the underlying concept is very useful. So due to the intensification 
sophistication of collective learning and the continued rise of complexity we've been talking about, you could argue that more change has happened in the past century than in the previous, like, 250,000 years of human history. And it's all roughly within living memory. You, your parents, and your grandparents have lived in one of the most complex and interesting times ever. <laughs> So since 1800, we've had a Cambrian explosion of innovation and discovery. Like, in the last few years alone, we've discovered a fundamental particle that weaves together the fabric of the universe, the Higgs boson. We discovered the largest ever black hole, which is about 17 billion times the mass of our sun. We found preserved woolly mammoth blood. We even have electric cars that go more than 125 miles per hour. Although you should drive them more slowly, obviously. We've grown to a population of 7 billion people, and your phone has more computing power than all of NASA did when they sent men to the moon in 1969. And collective learning is increasing exponentially. Here's Emily Grassley from the Brain Scoop to help us understand the scale of that growth of knowledge. As human populations grow exponentially, collective learning is undergoing a snowball effect. In humanity's first 250,000 years as foragers, about 9 billion people lived and died. Thanks to agriculture, in the last thousand years, about 55 billion people have lived and died, and 7 billion of them are around now. This is great for rising complexity. We now live in a unified global network of billions of brains. Communication is almost instantaneous, and we harness the power of the Earth and Sun on a massive scale. The potential for new breakthroughs in technology or in our understanding of the cosmos is heightened by all of this. It's all part of the continuous rise in complexity in big history, a trend that has been proceeding for over 13.8 billion years, from gas clouds to stars to single-celled organisms to trilobites to dinosaurs to culture. The beginnings of the Anthropocene weren't all sunshine and daisies, however. The late 19th century was marked by an increase in the destructiveness of weaponry. A number of colonial empires covered the entire Earth, with the exception of a few non-European states which managed to maintain their independence, and mounting nationalism and bigotry led to some terrible chaos in the early 20th century. World War I killed 15 million people, the Spanish flu which followed it and spread largely as a result of the unified global system that had previously been so valuable to collective learning killed off three times as many, and 50 million people were killed during World War II. Such is the devastating cost of increased innovation and connectivity. Following World War II, a new wave of industrialization entered East Asia. Central and South America, the Middle East, and other areas. Newly developed crops, especially strains of wheat and rice, helped places like India and China, which in the mid-20th century still suffered famines. Their populations exploded, for better or worse, and we harnessed the power of atomic fission, putting immense power in the hands of humans to be used for good or ill. It's the threat of nuclear holocaust combined with the possibility of an asteroid impact or supervolcanic eruption that makes scientists like Stephen Hawking encourage the colonization of the solar system to increase the chances of our species surviving. Coping with scarcity is the bottom line of much of organic history, encompassing all species, including humans. So for most of human history, the world was separated into four isolated zones. The agrarian communities within those zones were largely subdivided into separate social orders and classes and varying degrees of wealth. And the number of the wealthy landed gentry and aristocrats in the average agrarian civilization, whether it was Mughal India or Louis XIV's France, was between 10 and 20% of the total population. So at most, 20% of people were not poor. Today, in a united global system, I mean, except for North Korea, if you earn more than roughly $20,000 per year, as most working adults in the developed world do, you are in the top 20% of the world's richest people. You are part of the global aristocracy. But I should note that a couple things definitely have changed. For one thing, if you're part of the global aristocracy, you are enjoying a standard of living better than what kings had only a couple centuries ago. You probably have a refrigerator, you flip a switch and the lights come on, you have antibiotics, at least for a few more years. I mean, admittedly, Netflix doesn't have any of the good movies, but that's still a better entertainment option than what Louis XIV had. All he had was public executions. And hopefully the average person in the developed world today is a little more enlightened about the challenges of poverty than an 18th century aristocrat would have been, but the jury is still out on that one. I mean, that's why First World Problems is a meme, right? But how we behave toward the developing world in the next 100 years will determine 
determine much of how we are viewed not only by them, but by the thousands of future generations that come after us and read of our deeds in history. So, is human history a story of progress where life has become better for most people over the course of 250,000 years, and will life continue to get better for most people during the Anthropocene? We're gonna try to answer that by looking at the Anthropocene it's basically just a list of pros and cons. Pro. Since 1970, manufacturing jobs have lifted approximately 600 million people out of poverty. Modern technologies can now feed and clothe more humans than ever before. Con. More people in the developing world are forced from traditional ways of life and into factory jobs with poor safety standards, long hours, and measly wages. And a lot of the goods that they produce go overseas to enhance the standard of living of a prosperous and wealthy developed world. And while the ratio of impoverished to wealthy countries in 1820 was about 3 to 1, today it's closer to 70 72 to 1. Standards of living may be increasing on average, but the wealth inequality gap is getting wider and wider. But pro, we have managed to harness a lot of energy. Our use of coal and oil and nuclear power. These energy flows have allowed us to generate an astounding amount of complexity in our little corner of the universe and improve people's standards of living. Yeah, but con, current modes of production rely heavily on non-renewable resources that are not great for the environment. Unless you've been hiding under a rock for the past 20 20 years, you will probably have heard of climate change and the potentially devastating effects it will have. Furthermore, as humanity continues to force the environment to adapt to our needs, we are accelerating the rate of extinction of plant and animal species that don't happen to be useful to us. One of the reasons we call this period the Anthropocene is if humanity were to suddenly disappear and aliens were to land on Earth 500 million years later and start excavating, even if they saw no sign of the humans on the fossil record, they would see a mass extinction event rivaling the five most devastating mass extinctions in pre-human history. Pro. Collective learning's advances in medicine, agriculture, and genetic engineering have in the past 200 years lowered the death rate and freed billions of people from the cycles of starvation and famine that affected agrarian civilizations. Con. The tremendous expansion of populations in India and China have created a severe problem for the infrastructures of those countries. We now have 7 billion people on Earth and will grow to between 9.6 and 12 billion later in the century. Yet at our current rates of consumption and modes of production, the world could only support a population of 2 or 3 billion people who enjoy the same standard of living as people in the United States do. China's population may level off by around 2050, India's might level off by 2070. But Sub-Saharan Africa, a region of the world that already suffers from the highest levels of poverty and is least equipped to deal with problems of overpopulation, is set to expand enormously even past the year 2100. Add to this the likelihood that climate change will reduce the amount of arable cropland on the earth by 10 to 25 percent, and we may have a severe population problem on our hands. And as we can see from the population cycles of the agrarian period, overpopulation tends to spark more violence. Pro, in the long term, development of a country's economy tends to change demographic trends. While an agrarian civilization benefited greatly from a farmer having half a dozen kids, first to combat the high infant mortality rate, and second because by the time they were 12 they could help out at the farm, today kids take 18 to 22 years to educate. And they're expensive. Also adults end up having other opportunities open to them. Fewer kids, more hours on the Xbox, or pursuing a law degree, or a high-flying business career, whatever. Economic development can slow population growth. And many of the developed regions of the world populations are stabilizing, which is why it is important to foster economic growth in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Con! But what drives a lot of that economic growth? energy production, and developing countries are more prone to use inexpensive, fast, and dirty forms of fuel to develop rather than more expensive, eco-friendly alternatives. This compounds the environmental problem, which in turn can mess up the environment and compound the population problem. So it turns out, it's complicated, and we are a little bit ambivalent about the Anthropocene. In the next century, humanity's population growth will continue, but it'll hopefully level off between 10 and 12 billion people due to declining birth rates. If it doesn't, we might be in trouble. Well, we'll definitely be in trouble at some point, we just don't know when. But even if it does level off, we've still got problems concerning how to support all those people at a decent standard of living and how to find the energy to fuel that process. I mean, we're talking about between 10 and 12 billion people. The first time the world's population got to 1 billion humans was 1804. So right now, we're still heavily dependent on non-renewable fossil fuels. Well, technically, they are renewable, but you need like 100 million years. But there 
there are a few possible future scenarios. One, we are miraculously saved by some technology in the same way that the Industrial Revolution lifted humanity out of the recurring cycles of famine in the agrarian era. Two, we collapse miserably into ruins and ashes. I don't like two, Stan. Is there an option three? Well, there is. That's good news. Three, we can guide human society into a creative descent, a gentle decline of complexity to more simple subsistence living. Actually, you know what? I'm not crazy about three either. I am all for one. Now, at present, we don't know what scenario will play out. We're acting as if we will be saved by some technology, and in fact, that's the only way that leads to the continuing rise of complexity, but we can't just assume that will happen. Now, as for the potential dangers of the 21st century, there are environmental disasters, the rise of a superbug that wipes out millions upon millions of people, possible global conflict or a rise in instability. The next 50 years will be fraught with a lot of risk, but if we can somehow make it through what some call the 21st century bottleneck, things start to brighten again. We'll be a stable population of 10 to 12 billion increasingly well-educated and interconnected innovators, and that's great for collective learning in the 21st century. Who knows where such massive potential could lead? It's important to remember that while there are 7 billion people in the world right now, many of them don't have access to good education, and that limits their innovative potential. If in the future we see less poverty, as we've seen in the last 20 years, and more access to education, I'm kind of hopeful. As far as we know, we are unique in the universe, and if for nothing else, it is our duty to our own innate curiosity to survive and to see where this rising complexity leads. Our task as a species in this century is to survive it. If we can just manage that from the end of the 21st century, the universe may take us in a thousand astonishing directions. More on that next time. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this science celebration in the Mainz Palace. To me, it was not a surprise that uh, Paul Critzen favored a celebration with a scientific focus. Some months ago, when I asked him what he could imagine for his 80th birthday, he expressed the wish for a scientific event that addresses the Earth's environment, not only looking back, but also with a forward view. The term Anthropocene has come to the forefront in recent years and it has marked a paradigm shift. If mankind is of prime importance to our world, to our global, to our Earth system, then the question of influence of man mankind is a scientific one, 
It's also an ethical one. The role of scientists is to provide evidence, to provide options, to provide a range of alternatives. But the ultimate decisions then have to be made in the political arena, among politicians, in an interplay with society at large. Ihr Aufsatz über die Geologie der Menschheit ist ein Aufsatz über die falsche Einrichtung der Welt, der, wenn wir sie nicht ändern, zum Gau der Moderne werden kann. Und insofern ist das, was wir diskutieren über Klimawandel, Ressourcenkriege, die Zerstörung der Biodiversität, nicht nur eine bestimmte Form des Anthropozäns, sondern es ist vor allem auch eine Herausforderung an unsere Kultur. Verleihungsurkunde als Zeichen der Würdigung hervorragender Verdienste um das Land Rheinland-Pfalz und seine Bürgerinnen und Bürger verleihe ich Herrn Prof. Dr. Paul Krutzen Mainz den Verdienstorden des Landes Rheinland-Pfalz. Mainz, den 2. Dezember 2013, die Ministerpräsidentin Malu Traja. Ganz herzlichen Glückwunsch seitens der Ministerpräsidentin, aber auch von mir persönlich. It stimulates me to continue, um, even beyond 80 years, there's still life, and uh, uh, I, I will do my best. Many will follow me. Thank you very much. But the additional issue here that is not uh, spelled out is that it's not only the chemistry, but Paul had also addressed the issue, where do these nitrogen oxides come from? Nitrous oxide and so on. So that allowed me, I remember very well, doing calculations to see, well, what is the amount, what's the source strength for these compounds? I think it's, it's a wonderful example of how Paul's insight about nitric acid trihydrate particles and about that sort of chemistry was really key to understanding the Antarctic, but there's still significant questions at work about exactly how the solid PSCs and exactly the role of denitrification between the two hemispheres leads to such a, a remarkably different uh, uh, atmosphere in the Arctic compared to the Antarctic. <music> These are just two examples of where we don't have to wait for 160 nations to sign on a piece of paper. We can start climate mitigation individually at small scales. I'm not claiming that's going to solve the problem. At least we are not sitting in one place, not doing much. <music> First time I would like to emphasize that this is the Anthrop Anthropocene, the impact of human activities on its surroundings. I have grandchildren and I would like these grandchildren to live in an environment which is far better than it is at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.